This is the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. Anthony Burgess at the movies. The most obvious connection Anthony Burgess has to the world of cinema is of course A Clockwork Orange. Stanley Kubrick's 1971 film adaptation is currently celebrating its 50th anniversary and we're using this opportunity to investigate the impact of film on Burgess's work. In this episode, we're going to explore Burgess's interest in film, both as a consumer and as a screenwriter. We're going to follow Burgess's life from his early years as a cinema-goer in Manchester through to his first trips to Hollywood, where he wrote screenplays on subjects as varied as Mary Queen of Scots, The End of the Earth, William Shakespeare and The Wizard Merlin. Along the way, we'll hear recordings of Burgess talking about the influence of film on his work and his own experiences of working in the film industry. On the surface, Burgess's work in the cinema may seem incongruous to his extremely literary persona. Yet some of his first cultural influences were on the big screen. Burgess was a member of the first generation of writers to grow up with cinema, and his creative mind developed in tandem to the films he was seeing in the cinemas of pre-war Manchester. Burgess first visited the cinema when he was six years old. At the Empress Electric in Manchester, he saw films such as The Shake, the 1921 story of a romance between an American heiress and an Arab sheikh, and The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, a film about a family split by the events of the First World War. Burgess remembers going to the Empress Electric in his autobiography, viewing it as his induction into the world of the silver screen. He writes, So I began a lifetime's devotion to the cinema, a one-sided love affair in which I was more bruised than caressed. Burgess's early experiences in Manchester were entwined with his experiences of cinema, in particular going to the cinema with his father who played piano accompaniment to many of the first silent films that Burgess saw. His most sustained piece of writing about the cinemas of Manchester appears in The Piano Players, his 1986 novel based on his own upbringing by his musician father. The novel is in turns humorous and nostalgic, and gives a detailed picture of the film industry of the 1920s and 1930s, far away from the recognised cultural centres of cinema at the time. Here is Burgess reading an extract from the piano players to a live audience in Canada in 1988. What happened was that they put on this religious film in the cinema, The Star, about which there'd been so much trouble in the States when it was made. The Life of Our Lord... Everybody's saying it was too reverent a subject to be made into a movie for people to watch chewing chocolates and puffing fags and having a feel on the back row. You didn't actually see our Lord in the film, but that not being allowed, but you saw his hands uh, being held out and people looking with their mouths open and very reverent to a great white shining light, which was supposed to be him. It was mostly the camera that acted our Lord. Anyway, this film that came to the star, my dad was given strict instructions, not by the manager, but by the rector of the Holy Cross Church, which was Church of England, about due reverence being needed in the music he played. It seemed that some big religious council or other was sticking its snout into the distribution of this film and insisting that a clergyman should say a few words about it, giving a sort of sermon, really, before the film came on. No advertisements, no news, no comedy. Just a few holy words in this film, which was called The Light of the World. Anyway, this rector was with the manager and my dad in the manager's office, telling him all about due reverence. The thing for you to do, said the rector, is to play hymns ancient and modern all the way through. That would be reverent and altogether appropriate. But I don't know this ancient and modern thing, said my dad, me being brought up a Catholic. Oh, really? A Roman Catholic, are you? Pity, but never mind. (laughs) I will lend you a copy of the hymnal, and I think you'll find them easy enough to play. So, said my dad, our Lord has become the private property of the Church of England. Is that it? (laughs) Well, said the rector, the Church of England is the established church of the United Kingdom. It is logical, is it not, uh, to consult the traditions of the established church in a matter of general public enlightenment? And my dad showed him the poster that was hanging on the wall. There he said, look at the names of those who have made this film. Sid Schwartz and Emmanuel Rubenstein. <laughs> Real C of A, aren't they, eh? 
I reckon it's an imposition what you're asking. Watch it, Billy, said the manager, very quiet and like menacing. Oh, all right, said me dad, I've no alternative, have I? Just the same as it always was, the Catholics always getting the shitting end of the stick. Watch it, Billy, the manager said. All right, me dad said, I'll need a light over the piano if I'm going to have to play from music. First time I've ever had to do that. And he did it, and it was just like being in church. My dad gave out a great big sarky yawn when he had to play Abide With Me during the crucifixion, <laughs> uh, which really called for what he called diminished sevens and the like. They showed the picture all the week, except for the Saturday matinee, knowing that the kids wanted their usual hour gang and cowboys and Indians. And now my father did something terrible that he shouldn't have done. He put money on the horses, which he did sometimes, a bob each way, according to a system he'd got. And he usually just about broke even. But this Saturday, he put a bob to win on a horse called Salted Almond, uh, running in the two o'clock at Ripon, Joe Muggeridge up, and he'd been told it was a dead cert. Well, it couldn't have been, not at a hundred to one. But it came in all right at that price, so there must have been some fiddling. Dad hadn't collected yet, of course, uh, but he went into the coach and horses at five o'clock opening time after the kids' matinee, and he drank fast and solid, pints of draft bass with double scotches, all on an empty stomach. <laughs> I wasn't there, of course, not being allowed in pubs at my age, but I heard all about it. It was Mr. Bamber who worked on the telephones, who knocked on the door to say he'd seen me dad weaving his way to the Star Cinema and shouting the odds. And he'd heard about his win and him getting k in the coach and horses, so I'd better get over there and see that everything was all right. Everything was not all right, I can tell you. I got into the Star just in time to see me dad throwing on the floor the electric light that had been put there for the ancient and modern. That was while the rector himself on the stage was saying a few holy words. When the rector had done, my dad said, three cheers for the rectum. <laughs> but not too loud. And then when the picture started, he seemed to me to be playing not too bad. Though not ancient and modern, more something in the Dorian mode or the hyper-frigid air mode or something. Very solemn and like more ancient than anything in that, that in book. Then we had the birth of our Lord and dad played a Deste Fidelis. And he sang and tried to get everybody to join in. Venite adoremus, venite adoremus, dominum. I got over to him and he hardly knew who I was. But then he knew and he sobered up a bit and listened to me when I said, cut it out, you want to be sacked. So when camels came on, he contented himself with playing in a Persian market. <laughs> but in a kind of im like way. When it was Mary Magdalene, he did a kind of holy arrangement I've, of, I, I'm a girl what works hard for a living. <laughs> so that I don't think anybody noticed anything wrong. But soon what got into Dad was terrible, but it was sort of fascinating as well. Because he started to make a kind of grand opera out of it, singing in a high voice I'd never known he had. And making a kind of very solemn like waltz out of the eight Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. <laughs> the rector had gone off, most likely to get himself in fettle for Sunday morning, and there was nobody in the in like religious authority around. But I could hear one or two murmurs and then more, but some of the younger ones seemed to be enjoying it. But the draft bus and whiskey in my dad was having a new effect now. And he began to doze off with his fingers just trailing along the keys. Dad, Dad, wake up. Come on, let's get, let's get you home. Oh, God, it was a proper bloody mess. I couldn't help looking to see how much of this the audience was taking in. And what I saw was a manager hawked coming down to the aisle, very heavy-footed. Dad, Dad, for God's sake. He came to then, smacking his lips, which must have been very dry, squinted up at the screen and said, Who's that bugger up there, then? I squinted up too and could make out this bearded man leering and counting money he was pouring from a bag into his hand. That's Judas, Dad. <laughs> Judas, right. Then my father began to sing a new waltz song he was making up as he went along, doing big runs up and down the keyboard. Thirty pieces of silver, that's what I sold him for. Thirty pieces of silver, I am the son of a whore. His runs up and down the keyboard weren't all that, like, accurate, but his voice was very loud and clear. Of course, Hawks was furious, but didn't know what to do, especially as we were onto the crucifixion now, with just our Lord's hands and feet with nails in them showing, and all the women around the cross weeping like mad, and 
My dad had gone back to these very severe, loud, sad chords in the Lystragonian mode or whatever it was. <laughs> and he stayed on like that till the scene changed. He couldn't see what was happening up there, uh, so he kept squinting and he, his fingers were like very uncertain on the keys. And then he called, what's happening up there, girl? He's rose again from the dead, Dad. Do something like cheerful. And by God, he did. Oh, Christ Jesus, our Lord, help us. He started playing for He's a jolly good fellow. <laughs> With like, uh, with like descending octaves in the bass, and then he put the tune in the bass, and he did like all tinkling bells up there in the treble. Oh, Jesus help us all. One of the films from his upbringing in Manchester that he often returned to in his journalism and other non-fiction writing is Fritz Lang's Metropolis. He claimed it was his favourite film, and that seeing it made him aware of the possibilities of cinema. His memories of the film are also tied up with his father, who he recalls improvising music for screenings. Hisberg is reminiscing about his love of Metropolis from a lecture he gave at the British Film Institute in 1984. One of the films I chose, uh, which may still be my favourite film, I'm not quite sure, uh, is, uh, was Fritz Lang's Metropolis. It was a silent film, I think, made in 1925, 26. And uh, I remember my father accompanying that film. It was a very long film, and still is. And... Um, <laughs> When I was in uh, Iowa a few years ago, I, I insisted on playing the piano, doing what my father had done, accompanying this film at the piano, and I found out what hard work it was. When Burgess was drafted into the army in the early years of the Second World War, he left Manchester, but he did not leave behind his interest in cinema. While he was stationed in Gibraltar, he used some of his free time to review films for the Gibraltar Chronicle. It was the only time Burgess ever worked as a film critic, and the reviews show his engagement with cinema more than a decade before he published his first novel. The films he reviewed were mostly romances set during the war, or military adventures, but he proved to be a tough critic to please. Of the 1944 film Till We Meet Again, about an American airman who is sheltered in a French nunnery, Burgess wrote, quote, Hollywood always has a clumsy touch when dealing with religion and the religious. There is a rather unpleasant piquancy in the way the young nun is made to pose as the wife of the airman. He's even more direct when reviewing other films. He calls You Can't Ration Love, a 1944 comedy, quote, an awful waste of dollars. And of the Betty Grable film Pin Up Girl, he wrote, quote, how insulting the whole thing is, how lacking in grace, in intelligence, in charm. Despite these harsh reviews, Burgess did find films during the war that remained with him throughout his life. Films such as 49th Parallel by Powell and Pressburg are impressed Burgess, particularly because of the score by Rafe Vaughan Williams. Here he is in 1984 explaining his fondness for 49th Parallel. And in 49th Parallel, our country's at last, uh, the music was written by Ralph Vaughan Williams, uh, one of our greatest composers, and um, this was one of the films one of the films to which he wrote music, uh, he, I'm not going to sing it, but the, the opening of that film, the title music, is one of the finest tunes ever written. Uh, Vaughan Williams came to the studio one morning with the tune in his pocket and said, listen to this, and there we have it. Uh, throughout that film, we see how music uh, is an integral part, uh, not just a mere accompaniment to a film. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted people to see this film again. It's a good film by any standards about a group of Nazis who try to infiltrate into Canada and what happens to them. But the music is brilliant, and it's written by a great composer. When Burgess returned from the war, he became a school teacher. During his time at Banbury Grammar School in Oxfordshire in the early 1950s, he frequented the local cinema, The Regal. This was a particularly important time for Burgess, and it was instrumental in developing his creative imagination. The films he watched in Banbury tended to be European art films such as La Ronde, based on Arthur Schnitzler's play, which examines the sexual and romantic relationships between a group of Viennese citizens. Another film he watched during this time was Jean Cocteau's Orphée, a modern retelling of the classical myth of the bard Orpheus, who descends into hell to rescue the soul of his wife, Eurydice. In Cocteau's version, the action is transplanted from ancient Greece to the bohemian cafes of post-war Paris. It's a film that strongly influenced Burgess, and he remembers the impact it had on him when he writes, quote, 
The resonance of this retelling of the Orpheus tale is of a quality very hard to define, like poetry. More is said than seems to be said, and the reverberations of the images in the unconscious mind are not easily driven out. Orfe went on to influence Burgess's 1976 novel Beard's Roman Women, in which he recreated a sort of purgatory in Rome, where his main character is mourning the death of his wife, only to have his grief interrupted by mysterious and ghostly phone calls. When Burgess moved to Malaya in 1954, there were social events for the British expats that involved trips to the local film society. This is fictionalised in Time for a Tiger, the first volume of the Malayan trilogy. Burgess describes the programme of the film society as including Battleship Potemkin, The Cabinet of Dr Caligari and Metropolis, films which he held in high regard. Time for a Tiger also describes his characters going to the local cinema, in this quote from the novel. Sometimes they would go to the cinema and tortured by bugs watch a long Hindustani film about Baghdad, magic horses that talked and flew, genies in bottles, sword play, sundered love. While the description of this film sounds exotic, Burgess could have been thinking of the Alexander Corder produced Thief of Baghdad, which was released in 1940 and contains all of the elements Burgess mentions in his novel. Burgess's return to England from Southeast Asia was marked by a flurry of literary activity. It was during this period that he wrote his most famous novel, A Clockwork Orange, in 1962. Three years later, it was first adapted for the cinema, though not directed by Stanley Kubrick, but the artist Andy Warhol. Retitled Vinyl, Warhol's film was an unauthorised and loose adaptation of the book, filmed in his New York studio, The Factory, with some of his regular collaborators such as Edie Sedgwick and Gerard Malanga. Burgess was unaware of this adaptation, and it was primarily screened as a background to concerts by the Velvet Underground. In 1968, Burgess's life changed. Not only did he leave England for good, but he was also hired to write his first Hollywood screenplay. Will, or The Bawdy Bard, was a musical retelling of Shakespeare's life, and was intended to mimic the success of the 1967 film Camelot, starring Richard Harris and Vanessa Redgrave. Burgess was invited to Hollywood by the film's producer, William Conrad, and shown around all of the Hollywood sites. He ate at Chasen's and the Brown Derby, he viewed the celebrity graves at Forest Lawn Cemetery, and attended a party at which he mingled with stars such as Paul Newman. Burgess's Shakespeare film neared production, prospectively casting Robert Stevens as Shakespeare and Maggie Smith as Anne Hathaway. Eventually, the studio recorded demos of the songs by Burgess. Here is the song We Are Shakespeare's Boys from Will. We are Shakespeare's boys, lads whom Master Will employs. We will hold your horse if you pay, of course. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You must pay a penny and we get for our pains just a little farthing. Oh, thank you, your lordship. Will gets what remains. Will gets what remains. Will gets what remains. In the end, Burgess's script was never produced, despite these relics in the Burgess Foundation's archive. It was, however, the beginning of Burgess's career as a scriptwriter for hire, and he would subsequently go on to work on scripts in both America and Europe. He wrote script adaptations of his own books, Inside Mr Enderby and The Wanting Seed, and was hired to write screenplays about Edward Lear and Beethoven, among other subjects. Despite being in demand by producers and directors, Burgess found it was not so easy for his screenplays to be filmed. Here he is in 1984, lamenting the role of the screenwriter for hire. Since the uh, advent of the directorial cinema, the director as primary creator, uh, things have changed. And uh, if I write a script, uh, I know that however well I write it, it's going to be changed because this is just the law of the film world. Uh, however good your first version is, this has got to be changed, because it just has to be changed. And a film, a script, 
uh, can be a great work of art if it's written by a fairly responsible writer. Nevertheless, the hacks have to be brought in. This, again, is the law of filmmaking. The hack has to be brought in. I remember writing a, a film version of a, a series of novels by, by Mary Stewart, uh, who writes, uh, wrote a trilogy about King Arthur. Not a very good trilogy, in my opinion, but somebody offered me some money. I needed some money to, to write a script. I wrote the script, and then the uh, producer telephoned me from California and said, Burgess, would you be willing to forego your next sum of money so that I can pu uh, get a Hollywood hack to take over your script and make something filmable out of it? You see, this, uh, th there's a, a curious unwillingness to uh, accept uh, that a serious writer of fiction uh, can produce something new and, and acceptable. After Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange was released in 1971, Burgess was forced to defend the film's violence on television chat shows when Kubrick refused to appear. This experience was dramatised in his novel The Clockwork Testament, in which the poet Enderby adapts Gerard Manley Hopkins's poem The Wreck of the Deutschland into a film, and the director makes it into a sensational exploitation film. Burgess himself was still working as a scriptwriter for hire, and most notably in 1975 he was approached by Albert R. Broccoli to write a script for the forthcoming James Bond film The Spy Who Loved Me. This screenplay, which survives in the Burgess Foundation archive, shows Burgess recycling many of the characters and other details from his 1966 novel Tremor of Intent, itself a kind of Bond parody. Ultimately, his script was not used for the film, Broccoli instead opting for a script by Christopher Wood and Richard Maybaum. But the fact that Burgess was considered for such a high-profile film indicates the regard in which he was held in the film industry. The same year Burgess was hired to write this James Bond film, he was also invited to be on the judging panel at the Cannes Film Festival, along with Jean Moreau and George Roy Hill. The films to be judged included Werner Herzog's The Enigma of Caspar Hauser, Bob Fosse's Lenny Bruce biopic starring Dustin Hoffman, and Martin Scorsese's Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Burgess detested the experience, and claimed that none of the films were very good. When he recalled voting for the winner in his autobiography, he adds typical Burgessian drama. Quote, the big prize went with little difficulty to the Algerian entry. We were given an anonymous warning that a bomb would go off in the Great Sal if it didn't win. Burgess continued to work in film with mixed success until he died in 1993. In 1981, he worked with Jean Jacques Hainaut to help create the language of the caveman characters of the film Quest for Fire. He also wrote the rhyming English subtitles for the 1990 version of Serrano de Bergerac, starring Gérard Depardieu. Film remained an important part of Burgess's life, both professionally and as a cinema-goer. His literary work is inspired and influenced by the films he watched, and film often plays an important role in the plots of his novels. The Ludovico technique in A Clockwork Orange is cinematic in its conception, and characters become embroiled in the film industry in books such as The Clockwork Testament, Earthly Powers, The Piano Players, and Beard's Roman Women. Burgess witnessed all of the key developments of cinema, the birth of sound, the creation of the Hollywood studio system, and the invention of the blockbuster. In the end, Burgess toyed with the idea of retiring from novel writing and moving to, quote, some unviolent city to watch films all the time. He never did retire, but his love of film was the foundation of his creative imagination. You've been listening to the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. This episode was written and narrated by Graham Foster. For more information about Anthony Burgess, and to find out how you can support the work of the Burgess Foundation, visit www.anthonyburgess.org. If you have enjoyed this episode, why not leave us a review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts?